Salutations, one and all, and welcome to the first Ruby Recapped, focusing on Volume 9's first episode. Firstly, there are spoilers here, so if you haven't seen the episode, go do that first. I also can't use footage, or YouTube will slap me down. Tell me how the grass tastes, little man! <laughs> right, now that that's out of the way, let's get into what we saw. So after almost two years, this is finally happening. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! Now I know that there was the virus that can't be named because this platform will lose its mind, and Rooster Teeth has had some... issues. I won't get into that because that's not what my channel focuses on. But the important thing is, it's finally here. So this episode begins pretty much the same as the teaser for Volume 9. There may have been some tweaks, but by and large, it's the same. Ruby's been based off of fairy tales since its inception, and this place seems to be based off of Alice in Wonderland. I've never seen any iteration of that particular work, so forgive me if there are references that I don't pick up on. Now, this place doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Ruby travels in a straight line towards a ridge, but she keeps ending up back in the same small section of this jungle no matter how far she walks. She never tries walking to the left or right, which is what I would have done when I noticed this, but maybe that wouldn't have done anything different. She then sits down and begins to cry. I really can't fault her for this, after all that's happened. Thinking that you might be dead, being stuck in a world that makes no sense, not knowing what happened to those you care about, and being powerless to do anything about it could do that to you. Interestingly, the weather also responds to her mood. Notice that when she cries, it begins to rain, and that when she stops, the rain does as well. This makes me question what the weather does if there are multiple people in the area that have drastically different moods, but we don't have any answers to that question as of yet. But Ruby encounters a mouse who can speak. The mouse questions what Ruby's name is, and then is perplexed that her name doesn't describe an action. This indicates that, at least with these mice, and maybe other things here, their name depends on their purpose or role, kind of like the Kunari in Dragon Age. She decides to name the mouse Little, at least for now. But we cut to Weiss and Blake, who have somehow already found each other. Given that this land doesn't make any logical sense, they might have ended up near each other. But that's just speculation. Weiss dodges Blake's question when the latter asks her what happened, though. I can imagine that she doesn't want to revisit that matter just yet, and Blake can tell that things didn't go as planned. The two then locate Gamble Shroud, though, which has almost completely been wrapped up by a vine-bearing plant. The two try various methods to get it out, but I have to question why Weiss never used any glyphs. That should have at least done something. But once Blake touches the plant, it ensnares the two, and more mice show up, declaring that the two are prey. This happens just as Ruby and Little arrive. Apparently, Little was able to convince them to release Weiss and Blake, but if I were Ruby, I'd have just stomped them all until they were just smears on the ground. Remember, they referred to Weiss and Blake as prey. That implies that they were going to eat them, or at the very least, nothing good was going to happen to them. I have the same problem with the Ewoks in Return of the Jedi. They're eaters of other sapients, which isn't cute like the media in which they're in portrays them. I'd also like to know how the mice were never caught by this plant. Are they too light for it to notice them? Then how did they get Gamble Shroud stuck in it? But Little volunteers to guide them to the ridge that Ruby was trying to reach, but decides to pass out once they reach a path. Little is about as useful as Paimon in Genshin Impact, it seems. I do have to wonder how these mice managed to avoid the stuck-in-one-place phenomenon that Ruby encountered, and why nobody else seems to have that problem. Once again, though, Weiss dodges the question of what happened after they fell. And again, this lets the others know that something's up. But before the issue can be pressed, though, they reach the top of the ridge, and there's a strange creature present there. Its design and dark colors are heavily reminiscent of the God of Dark's non-dragon form, and he moves in a weird fashion too. Granted, his is just rapid twitching, while the God of Dark's was just the appearance of broken bones and joints, 
but it's still odd nonetheless. It has this unusual method of constantly voicing what it's doing, such as stalking and searching. That might make those tasks a little bit harder to do if you're constantly making noise, my dude. It notices that the others are present though, and Little hides in Ruby's cloak. Whether this is because Little knows what this thing is, or is just scared of it, we don't know. But it would seem as though Yang had been fighting this thing, as she hurls a rock at it, and it flees the 4 to 1 odds. Yang is oddly missing her prosthetic arm, which was described as stolen. How that came to be, I guess we'll just have to find out later. Weiss can no longer avoid the question of what happened though, and she hastily describes that Penny, in her words, sacrificed herself. She also says that Jean tried to help, meaning that she was at least somewhat aware of what was happening while she was fighting Cinder. Weiss was the MVP of that fight, hands down. We don't get to hear if she tells the others that Winter is the new maiden though, as Ruby faints upon hearing of Penny's demise. When she comes to, the others wonder if they're dead too, but Blake looks over the ridge and says that she thinks that they're in a fairy tale, seeing the nonsensical and bizarre landscape before them. And that's where this episode ends. We do get to see what will be the intro of the following episodes though. I don't usually give intros any attention, as in most shows they're either meaningless fluff, shots of what's going to happen, or vague symbolic stuff that I don't personally care for. But there are three points of interest in this intro. Firstly, Ruby isn't responsive to outside stimuli like the other three are, just sort of walking with a dejected posture. Second, they're accompanied by a shaded out character who oddly has a few design similarities to Penny, with the poofy hair and a similarly styled dress. Thirdly, when we do see this character at the end, Neo fades into this character, implying some sort of connection. What that could be, I can only speculate. Is this what Neo actually looks like, or looked like, and that everything we've seen is an illusion? Or is she affected by this place into thinking that she's this person? No idea, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But overall, I'm excited for a new season of Ruby after almost two years. The drought was becoming rather annoying, as I'm sure some of you have also experienced. But if you found this video entertaining or informative, then leave a like if you're so inclined, and subscribe to see more. And may you all have a weapon in each hand.